Doctor Who by Tom Baker, Scratch Man. Fear of saving the universe. There was an uproar on Gallifrey, the Cyberman, in league with a creature from another reality, that was attempting to evade this dimension. Surely, Doctor, you could see the danger your universe is in. The zero known proud the stage beside me, being very reasonable, very loudly. Your only option should have been to seal the rift between universes by destroying the Earth. There's a lot of nodding agreement. Now I told him I had to save my friends, and that there was a sort of plausible eruption. A beam of light tightened its grip around me. I felt to breathe. Instead of which, you were tearing off on other of your ventures. An old Chancellor heaved himself to his feet. Inexcusable. Your duty is simple. Forget your friends. Forget your pet planet. Save your illness. A smug little blank manager's chuckle. After all, isn't that what you do? He waited for me to answer. But I was too... Much and too much pain, even to blink. The light round me dimmed a little. Well, Doctor, prompted the nun, as I took a breath. What have you got to say for yourself? A malicious presency reminded me of someone. Your unconscious hatefulness of Mrs. Farrack. The idea amused me. Mrs. Farrack would have made a good time lord, creature of no imagination, no ambition, no love. I rallied. I needed to convince them. Of what was all, what was at stake? I'm trying to show you how I changed again. When I left this place, I was still very much a time lord like you. I never set out to save the universe. My travels, I may have saved the odd little world, stopped a few wars, but it was you, you yourselves, who were reasonable for the first time. I saved the universe. You packed me off to the dreadful chalk planet of the world to save everyone for the master. His doomsday weapon. You needed me to stop him, because you knew the Time Lords would have been first up against the wall when he took control of it. My Time Lord audience went silent. A sword of never buzzed menacingly over me. Yes, I said. You're not above a little bit of meddling. Yourselves when it suits you. But surely, Perdom Zero None. What? was different. That was different, was it? I asked, innocent as milk. How? Well, piped up Lady Palomini Vava, with the universe in peril, you should have called on us for help. And you, with your collective refuse to dirty your hands, you would neither have quite, quietly wiped the planet Earth the earth out, or you just pack me off into the dim- that dimension, hoping I'll sort things out, which is precisely what I did anyway. Even so, the old goat of a chance I gave a c- complicit smile to Lady Prolevera. We have to be careful, don't we? Oh, indeed, Chance, I said. You have to be very, very careful, especially when you're voyaging into the unknown. Book Two, Scratch Man. Chapter Sixteen. I stepped from the TARDIS and suddenly realised I didn't know who I was. Not, no, not a clue. Well, that was odd. I frowned. The journey had been a difficult one. It didn't take me long to realise that something had gone wrong with my lonely ship. As soon as I stepped inside, I could tell. How? Hello, you do thing. You've, have you been redecorating? When I left the TARDIS control room, had been a shining white library, humming like an aunt in a butcher's queue. Now she's dark and foreboding, her empty spaces tickling ominously away. Dense vines cover the walls, poking and jabbing away into the floors and ceilings. It was cold and grim and no longer felt like home.
something up. I swept some creepier than a I swept some creepier creeper from the controls a bit better to play for concert pioneers for confronting a saloon bar pioneer using only a machine do not like me nor me two of us we have a report she knows where I want to go then if she refuses to send me there even if she refuses to send me there. But this time the levers are sluggish, the dials are weary, ship's engines groaned, I engaged them, filling the chambers with agonised wheels. I know, I know, you poor thing, I muttered, patting her. I know you don't want to go, but we have to. We have to go and find, I paused, lick my lips, find Sarah and Harry. Trumpets to protest continued, but with a curiously little question mark at the end. You see, there's another dimension poking into this one. Taken Sarah and Harry. You like them, don't you? Even though Harry leaves his towels on the floor. Do go on, the engine said. Well, we can always get some new companions later, if we must. But, we, but let's get the old ones first, back first. No sense of leaving companions lying around. We only get up to mischief and we'll have to seal up the realm. Energy is seeping through. Making itself at home here, behaving very badly. At first, I thought it was nanites or virus, but no, nanites are charming things. Whatever this is, creeps around, twisting everything it touches. Idiots call it magic, but it's worse. Why, look at you! It's trying to infect you. It's even had got me. I lift my leg and popped it up on the console, running back my sock. A scratch ran down my shin. The wound, growing, glowing gently. We're lucky we were resilient, but poor old, poor old Sarah and Harry went down like skittles. That's what's going to happen to all creation if you don't seal it up. The ship protested. Yes, I know it's far easier to call for help, get the time mods to seal it from the outside. Taking a TARDIS inside that dimension is going to push the gap wider, broiled a bridge across the chasm. We have to do, but we have to do, don't we? Because of Sarah and Harry, the ships, I suppose so. And well, because I broke into Tide Green, because it's going to be fun. The ship's engine chuckled. I got her. I twisted a dial and felt it respond a touch more. I broke. Abhorrently, ah, now we're talking. The TARDIS jumped away from the island, and pluckily blue box flowing itself into vivid scar that hung over the horizon. The plucker, in reality, was no bigger than a tear in an envelope, but after the TARDIS had pushed its way through, it was a little bit larger. It floated on the sky like a moat of dust in the eye. You could see it around it with perfect ease. You barely even notice it unless you tried. But it was getting bigger. The ship plunged down through the tear, and I clung to the controls. Both my ship and I were putting on a brave face. Both of us were, were infected. Which gave us passports into the nightmare realm. We cannot, but not without cost. I could feel the infection spreading, creeping, nibbling through my brain. Which gave us passports into that nightmare realm, but not without a As the engines of the ship rose and fell on the lights, seen from the heart of the ship, a sickly, dirty orange glow that stuck to the air. The poor old girl was very ill. Oh, she was a fighter. Close we got to our destination. I blinked. And where are we going again? Why are we going? A ball the infection tightened to grip on us both. A crack like sniffing fever recalled me to my senses. On the wall, on the walls, my lovely walls, I spilt down the middle, and brambles spilled out, thorns scraping at the panels. There was a darkness behind the walls, one that glowed as some healthy ochre. Well, we'll get there, I thought, but in how many pieces, and can we get back?
The machine gave another roar, one of danger and distress. Well, get there, I repeated, holding her like a sick old hound. I'll get there, even if it kills us, the TARDIS landed. I stepped out into a blasted heath. Hello, I said. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, oh dear. I rubbed the back of my head, marvelling at the lovely tangled curls of hair everywhere. Well, that was something. I pushed my fingers into my face, strong forehead, sharp nose, tucked a finger across my teeth. Well, there was a lot of them squeezed in there. Somehow, obviously wonderful for eating apples. I rummaged in my pockets and produced my apple. Along with a promising bit of string and a lolly stick. Whatever I was, I had a very useful coat. I stuffed at a, suffered a moment's confusion that, about why Peter would be wearing such a long scarf. Was it cold here? Didn't seem that cold. I peered at my surroundings. Well, they weren't promising. I was standing in a gully, tall black mountains, rearing up the either side of me, their peaks belching sulfur into the dirty, butter sky. The narrow path stretched in either direction, me in erundering between lumps of coal, the styes of boulders, rivulets of lava trickled down the slopes, soaking air with smuts and fumes, pulling in a slow crawling river about its way through the valley. A smell triggered, lingered at the back of my throat, a heady whiff of a petrol station mixed with a choking fat of a repertoire fire. Charming place. Vast and rumbling at its emblems was. It felt claustrophobic, hardly space to think, let alone be to breathe out. Breathe, not in this choking air. I wondered if the area in which I landed was as good as this place got. Perhaps it's just a quarry or something around the corner. It was quite nice, actually. Maybe there would be a tea shop. Peered over the side of the path. She is split from under my shoe. I looked at the lava hissing as it shakes its poisonous way on the bottom of the valley. Well, not from missing. I turned back to my ship and groaned. The TARDIS outside was normally a cheery, incurious blue box battered by countless shapes, grapes, well dragged each over through, though, through. The overall look of it was friendly and absurd, but even was a what even was a police box? I wasn't sure I'd known at that some point, but I couldn't put my finger out on it at that moment. Whatever the phone box police box was, it's equally at home anywhere in the universe, a doggy little blot, a landscape, a friendly message on the door and a cheery little lump lamp on top. I saw an air with a battered remnant, blue surface of burned by the fires, and through the woodwork blistered and buckled as those strange, thorny creatures pushed their way out, scouring the surface. As I watched the briars wrap themselves around the box, its closed it completely and squeezed. There was a terrible splintering sound, and the glass in the doors shattered. More creepers poured out. The light on the top went dark. The friendly message on the door fell off. I stood there bereft. What have I done? I turned and edged my way on my way along the path. I'm a long way to go and even longer before I can go home. I slouched for on for a bit. Really? If I wanted to visit a, a painting, it wouldn't have been, see, been by Turner of Harry Bosch. There was a watercolour by Moyet. I could have happily held it in. On Amber Light by Tiger at Nine. I wouldn't have minded a weekend child cottage in. But no, I thought as a keep superstitious, su- sulphurous promise over the side of the narrow path. Here I was trapped in some art school temple. Per tantrum. I reached the summit of the peak. To the left and the right were more dismal mountains. Look back. The invitation 
the awful black vine spreading out the ruin of my ship. There's no other life, just endless smoky horizon cinders, a constant volcanic grumble. I've no idea where I'm going, I lamented, which is tiresome. I leaped across a boulder. It was disagreeable, the sharp. My leg throbbed, I tugged my, my shoulder, treasure leg, a mark that glowed the same old amber as a lava trickling down, trickling past me. Had I known it was there, there was something crawling and wiggling underneath the wound, just looking at as if it making me feel, just make, looking at it made me, making me feel worse. Well, that's no good, I said hastily, tucking my trousers into my socks. If I could, would, would, could forget my name, I could certainly forget about a small scar, couldn't I? Readied myself to trudge on further. A path suddenly gave way beneath me. Rumbling and shaking lava bubbled its way up through it. This place is not welcoming, I sighed. A scrambling hastily up onto another bol- one boulder. Then, as they began to sink into lava, leaving across to another. As the lava hissed and surged about me, I realised I was playing hopscotch in hell, using lumps of clinker. Like stepping stones, picking up my way across this ridge, it flowed and shifted around me. The last boulder stranded me eight feet from the solid ground. Around me, a stream of lava gulloped and puddled, hissing and splashing, and just daring me to fall in. I have to have had better days, haven't I? I lamented to the lava, wondering if it, that was true. Gathering my scarf on my wits about me, I leapt through the air, landing on a winding, in a winding belly flop on the serene gravel. Breathless, miserable, choking on the vile air, I crawled my way up to a narrow incline, wrapping the charred remains of my scarf around my hands to try to save them from hot flints. Finally, I reached the side of a path. My head thumping in a diesel atmosphere. I found myself completely at loss. I couldn't remember for the life of me who I was, where I was, or why I was here. What do we do now? I followed my voice echoing from the moment from the mountains. What do I do? What do I do? Which is when I heard the noise. A mut- a puttering a friendly, uttering, incongruous puttering. An old black cab lumbered into view, making its way ominously along the mountain path. A light on the top was on it was on, which was the most hopeful thing I seen for a while. I scrambled on my feet and stuck my thumb out. Then threw all caution aside and windmilled my hands in the air. Taxi? Chapter 17 I just had them all in here. I had them all in here, said the driver. Oh yes, I was doing my best to make polite conversation. I find it difficult, with no idea who I was, so in the back of a black cab, being driven thoroughly through burning mountains. Animal, the driver repeated. His voice had worn itself out with use. Got a name, have you? I appeared to have mislaid it, I confessed. I had it when I left the house today, but... Don't you worry, it'll come back to you. Happens a lot when you're crossing the waters of Liffey. Little man in a greasy peak cap tapped the side of his head. Wait a minute, I know who you are. His eyes twinkled shrewdly. Shrewdly, you do? Yeah, I've had enough of your I've had enough of your salt in here. My salt? I felt a moment's worry. Yeah. Did you didn't you used to be the doctor? Oh, that's right, I'm the doctor, I exclaimed. You was right, how to look for what a minute. My face fell. Wait, did you say used to be? A tiny rat faced man grinned triumphantly, showing off his remaining tooth. Of course you were. We are all other people, the man sniffed. I used to be a policeman. A lovely bicycle, but it was that was long ago. 
have been met trying to cope with a sudden surge of memories. I had an oddest query collection on a beach. Maybe the driver gave a Patricia Smith back when you were the doctor, perhaps? I still am the doctor, I protested, and worried at how that sounded. Nah, driver seemed very certain. You used to be all over now. That's what I would, would I was telling you. Where were where was I talking? Yeah, the driver considered considered I'm Charlton. This is my job to transfer the living to the land of the dead. Am I dead? This was a lot to take in. Well, you're here, aren't you? Charlton cleared his nose flatly one after a time. I collect lost souls, as I said. I had a mole in here. Oh, your lot. My lot? I felt totally confused and I just wanted to be home, whatever that was. Oh, yes, the white-haired fellow with the velvet. I had him not so long ago. Right, good little natter we had. Of course, he had, didn't leave me a tip. So I didn't know I could simulate I thought previous self. I remember him. He had many things. He had many things, but he was a terrible tipper. A clutching at facts like a dizzy kitchen stream. I only somehow brought the TARDIS to land of the dead. Why? Was it even such a place? Charlton, the t- cab driver, continued to drone on. Stretch it out, out, if you like. Have a nap. Probably sprung seats, those are. Cozy as a bed. Breezer says I had a lovely doze. One knee up. Talking about daisies, fella, before he sits on bending the engine. Couldn't let it get it going again properly for weeks. Could all be a hoax, I mused, but I was beginning to doubt it. Am I really dead, I asked. Forgive me. You must be being you must be being asked that all the time. Don't be fret, Charlton gave a good natured little chuckle and offered me a tin of bold sweets. All part of the job. Daxi puddled along, winding up path, past the chickering, slowly trickling river of lava. An easy silence settled between us. I still hadn't got an answer to my question. I wondered if I should find a delicate way of reframing my question. Yeah, you're dead, mate, shuddered and blurted out. It's my job to throw you to your, uh, to your forever home. I see, I always wary of infusion. Infusion. Jobs get harder, of course. Job's got hard, of course," said Charlton. "Just his cat. It used to be a low, be a low, lovely road. At that point, the taxi lurched a little. One wheel skiltering over the edge on the narrow path. I grabbed for my hat. Close one," said Sheridan. "What would happen if I fell in that? I mean, if I really am dead, would I go back to the start, like in snakes and ladders? Tricky, as I never tried it." Charlton sat there with his teeth. I see the logic when you put it like that, but no, that lava indicated a bubbling mass the car was sliding towards. That's Ify. He swung the gears in reverse and taxi we had mounted the bath. This river of oblivion. Oh dear, I said. It's not how that he described it in the books. It's rather a gentle right gentle write up. True, true, Shadowton nodded sagely. But times have changed, the land has changed. All this used to be Epherson Epherson Fields. The car splattered from through a trundle of burning mountains. I mused on what I have been told. I tried to keep an ear open to what the cab driver was saying. I was finding it a little difficult to concentrate. My mind was trying to race, but kept finding chunks of itself were missing. The result was a hesitant tiptoe through my memories. Of course you're probably worried how things are. Going back home, said Charlton. Am I? You look consult shot amused. It's only natural. I had a Martian warlord in here the other day. In a right state he was. Apparently taken stickle to the third spleen in the middle or right set to fretting about that battle wouldn't go well without him. Demanding a turn an old bus around. And could you? I felt a surge of hope. No. Ah, of course not. Then 
They all ask, no harm in it, don't apologise. She had and steered us into swaying benches over perilous, perilous charm, looking down. A realise of planks had made out of bones of some giant creatures. Everyone's like that, whether it is war, the office, or even the rose god, everyone's got something they need to go back for. Sheldon cleared his nostrils again. But don't you worry, the others have gone. So I'm taking a boo without you. Does it? I wasn't entirely certain about that. You see my line of work? Well, I hate to seem immodest, but if your wind is the right direction, I sometimes save the universe. I'm sure you did, said Sheldon politely. But you didn't, don't worry. Some of chaps stepped in your shoes already. Really? I wondered what. Was that really the case? I had sort of enjoyed being a doctor. Oh, yes, lovely young fellow. Oh, God, a friend. Young, you say? How young? Hey, boy type, Charlton muttered, with just enough of a twist. Eager enough, I dare say. But tell them all, well, it's like when I had the grumpy old one in here. You remember him? Oh, I do. He was the one, I tell you, constantly asking me to turn the bed heating up. Every other so worried about the little chap who came after anyway. I told him you're in safe hands. Relax and have a rest. It's some cons- that's some consolation, I suppose, said so Pintley. It's just, I really feel I was only getting started. We're having such fun. A sudden memory jabbed at my soul. I've not been travelling alone. How could I have been forgot- I've forgotten them? Sarah, Harry and I. What fun we had. Shame it all ended. I couldn't remember saying goodbye to them. Oh, but oh well. I hope they were doing well. A miserable thought struck me. They were probably doing well indeed. Without me. You'll be all right, said Charlton. The taxi started up another blasted hill. A driver turned to me with a confidential air. It might be all over for you, but I'll tell you this, if I may, sir. You're always my doctor's doctor. Thank you. That's very nice of you to say, I said. Feeling my head shrink back to cushions of the sink, seat, sink, and keep going. I was so tired and perhaps, perhaps, I could just, just once have a rest. A turkey taxi jerked to a stop, startling me out of my reverie. Aha! Oh, here comes trouble, remarked Shonaton, sounding sourly annoyed. I blinked, wondering, just for a moment, where I was. Now I, how I ended up here, what was happening, I was aware. I'd been about to drift off to sleep, and had the oddest sensation that would have been a bad thing. The cab's engine was idling. Ahead of us, blocking the path, was a single, silver figure. What that's a, what's the Cybermen doing here? I said, staring at it, at it in alarm. It was a cyber leader, skull, wide up to his metal head, who was standing in the middle of the road, bringing <coughs> his weapon to bear. <coughs> I leapt forward, trying to grab the steering wheel, but put that, but the partition wouldn't let me. What are you doing? asked Charlton, slapping my head, hand out of the wet tray. We kept his six persons. Drive, get away, I yelled. First blast of the gun hit the cab. The windscreen shattered. Another blast. When the lights went up in flames. A third shot dinged off the roof, tearing a sizzling strip out of it. My cab, wailed the driver. Get us out of here, I shouted. Out on this path, you must be joking, snorted the cab driver. No explosion rocked the car. Then open the door, I demanded. With a sniff of bad grace, the driver released the lock on my door. I threw it open and crouched behind it. It is a shield. I popped up behind it. I waved to the cyber leader. Hello there. The shot impacted the door. I popped up again. A little to the left, another shot severed the door from its hinges. This is exactly what I planned. Seizing the loosening. Door. I rushed towards the cyber leader. 
feeling a metal glow hot in my grasp as it took the blunt a shot of the shot from his gun. Cap doors were built to withstand many things. A small collision, hobnail boot of governess, but cannot sustain themselves for long against concentrated energy weapons. Had to be quick. I rushed forward, charging into the outside leader. It plunged its fist at the door, releasing a lethal blast of electrical energy which fizzled over the surface, felt it crackle and a kind of cage about me. I realised that my hunch about the doors by poetry acting as insulator paid off. I raised myself from my crouch, peering up through the window to find myself eye to eye, eye to eye, eye with a sky leader, barren socket of its skull glaring at me bleedfully for its helmet. With some awkwardness, I cracked a handle winding down the door corridor's window. Hello, I said. Have we met before? The sky leader did not reply. I do think we have, I continued. But that, well, but what puzzles me is what you're doing here, besides, of course, attacking public transport. Can you offer an explanation? So I believe the skull continues to say at me, a sickly light glowing deep inside it. You're looking blank, more than usual, I say. I risked a sympathetic choke. Neither, either you have a plan that's so complicated and out out are tedious that you may have flesh and bone organism like me would understand it, or you're just as baffled to find yourself here as I am, which is very interesting, you think. Should we compare notes? Hmm? There's a pause. I must fight you, said the cyber leader. My mind was properly racing once again. Oh, how I missed that feeling. Right now, standing on the side of a burning mountain, and what may or may not be the afterlife, squaring up to the Cyberman. I'm not entirely sure why any of us are here, any thoughts are spinning, my thoughts are spinning around like a goats on a merry-go-round. They were beginning to form a nasty suspicion, one that kept refusing to focus itself. A cyber leader reached round the door and grabbed my hand, crushing it like a vice. Clearly, its power and packs were drained, otherwise it would have been lit up like a crystal, this crystingle. But that was really, that was really my little... A very little comfort. We fill the bones of my wrists, sliding over over themselves in a desperate hurry to get out of each other's way. I wrenched my hand free and grasped and stared up the cyber leader, the little car window. Would you mind not doing that, I said, trying to ignore the pain. Your actions are not so logic- logical. You are motivated by emotions, confusion and fear. As leader's skull glowed an angry red. I will say this, though. I remarked, "You've got my mind working again. I'm not. I'm not just. I'm not just remember who I am, but how I do, how but how I do what I do." My face pulled back from the door, ready to plunge forward into my face. I've been hoping for exactly this. I looked at look, the to the glass window, tapping the creature's fist into the door. In the door, I stepped rapidly away. I'll pick up this later, I said, blowing on my fingers, and driving back, diving back into the cab. Sheridan took a moment to consider the dear leader, with his arm trapped in his body door. He watched the creature smashing the door against the ground, then looked back at me accusingly. Well, what do you want me to do about that, all this, then? Try, please, I smiled, grinned suddenly. I do hope you're insured. The cab started up and moved away. As it accelerated, I risked a glimpse back, freed from the door, so I believe it was now racing towards us. It reached in through the open space, grabbing me by the shoulder. Drive faster, I cried, desperate to be free of the creature. It was yanking me half out of the doorway, and a razor-sharp gravel was whipping beneath my face. On it, Guy, said Sheridan, and the car put up a welcome spurt of speed. I wrenched myself free, back inside the car, and watched the cyber leader slow down, come to stop staring after us. I wonder what you're doing here, I mused, rubbing my shoulder. Sheridan drove us on, us on, reaching a curious dead end, the road caused by a yawning abyss. We have to go through the shallows. Sheraton announced, 
and indicated left. Not the shallows, I exclaimed. Why? What are they? What are the shallows? There you'll see, much Sandra muttered, and turned it off into a side road, bumping down a disputable slope. We emerged in a valley that was, by comparison, lush and verberant. Occasional plants struggled to exist among the premises. Trespassing among them were odd crouched figures. These would be the shallows. There you got it, Sheraton acknowledged. I looked keenly at the figures they were. No, had been humanoid. It bent over. At first I thought it was the effort of their work. But then I realised their postures were deformed. Their people, these people scuttled. Some of them were a different number of limbs or an extra head. Many were converted, covered in dirty crevices. The surface of shell pitted and in packs from stumbling lava. Got among them were scarecrows. Some toiled beside them. Others hung from poles on the crest hills. Sentinels. Are these the natives of this place? They are more than the, rem- the, more the remains of them. Poor blighters, said Sheridan. He said, Dis- if your disappointment, you end among the, the fairly sharpish disappointment, disappoint. This is a few new developments, not a welcome one. Sheridan spat through the shattered windscreen, his spittle hissing at the land on the hot bonnet of his cab. His face has laws, you know. Not many, but one of them to keep his nibs entertained. The sad souls gave up. They just look and just look at them. I watched as one of them crawled forward. Part of the face was human, but the nose and mouth and jaw all excluded into a long beak. It picked up a lump of rock in its teeth and lawfully munched on it. It gave me a look of utter despair. The poor things, I said, are really working out that well, what to do. Jerry nodded. I can't stand the sight of them. Plus, from time to time, they think the cab's food. Normally, I can keep them off. But today, you're missing a few bits. Sorry about that, I said. Jerry shrugged. Making a living in the land of the dead is getting harder. We drove out, and the ground began to slope upwards among again. I looked back at the thousands of tolling creatures scrubbing away the charcoal and gravel. I want to help them, I said. Newcomers do, Sheraton sniffed, disapproval. You'll grow out of it. I hope not, I proclaimed, seeing the cyber leader had choked at the rumbled rumpled drug in the living room. My soul, dead or not, I was a doctor. I solve problems. I'm good with lost souls. We see, sniffed Sheraton. He looked at the head and ignored my next few attempts at conservation. conservation. He crested away another hill and swept onto an unwelcoming plateau. Large boulders lay around us. Only we pass, as we passed, I realised the broken heads of giant statues lying scattered around their soulless stone eyes gazing emptily back at me. What are they? Eternal rulers, Sheridan grunted. All that remains of them. A glow and filling shrunk round my boots. I disappointed you, haven't I? I suggested. Sheridan shrugged. Doesn't matter to me. One way or another, Gov. What have I done? The others notice it sooner, that's all. Notice what? Exactly another sniff. I guess that comes on an age when you stop looking up. Anyway, we're nearly there. The cab pulled up. I got out, looking around. Here go does here does not seem to be anywhere. Sheridan considered the his remark physiolo- physiologically, all the while letting his sturdy wild engine butt away. Fair enough. I suddenly realised I'd forgotten what I've forgotten to do. Hazy and patted down my pockets. Ah, oh, I announced. You're fair. The damage to your cab. I'm most totally sorry. But I haven't the money on me right now. That's so, Sheridan cleared his throat, hawking a small amber 
on his on the dust. Last one said much the same thing. Well, add it to my account and get the next one to pay. I grinned and produced a bag of sweets. They always helped. Have a jelly baby. Please, Sheridan took one. Thank you, Doctor. You're yeah, doing nicely, he said, smiling with both of his teeth. He popped the sweet in his mouth, turned in a tight circle, and drove away. As I watched the little black cat vanish, the bizarreness of this situation steadily crept up on me. I hope this is all a, isn't all a dream, I remarked. Holographic simulation. That's to be tedious. Maybe it's my added brain. But I can't. But I just can't put my finger on what's going on here. I kicked a few lumps of rock. It didn't help. Well, I'm not selling into the face of one of the carved heads. It opened a great stone eye, gazed at me in silent approach, and shut it again. I do beg your pardon, I bowed, and turned away. How did I let Sheridan down? I mused. Something about not looking up. At least I thought that this was as strange as it was as it's going to get, which is when I noticed a castle floating in the sky.